what is going on everybody welcome back here to the channel i'm sean davis and welcome into the reveal on my number 22nd ranked team in my nba preseason power rankings with a deep dive into the san antonio spurs let's go i am pumped up for this episode uh if you guys can't tell uh please 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 do me this one big favor guys if you are new and you're watching this hit that like button and subscribe here to the channel takes two seconds this vi this series has taken a lot of energy and a lot of time to put together. So really, really appreciate if you guys just take the two seconds to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more great NBA content. We have a bunch of stuff lined up before the season starts. We're going to finish this series, obviously. We're going to do uh, some film breakdowns before the season starts at top 25 players under the age of 25. We have a bunch of stuff to go before this season kicks off here. So leave a subscribe, hit that like button, excuse me, and subscribe here to the channel if you guys are new but san antonio spurs coming in at 22nd here maybe a surprise to some people here but i mean i don't want that to like get like misconstrued or whatever with my like thoughts and opinions on the spurs team especially after diving into some of the film uh from this spurs team that was a bad team last season they had the fourth pick and the eighth pick pick respectfully for a reason um and that's how they were able to land a stefan castle for an example who we will touch on in just a sec but the spurs come in here 20 seconds like i mentioned they come in with the 79.771 grade and that is as you guys can see a pretty significant like jump up from our number 23 team which was the charlotte hornets go check that episode out if you haven't already but you know you can kind of consider this a tier break within a tier if you will um and there's also going to be a pretty massive jump between 21 and 20, uh, which you guys will see here soon as well. But this first team is fun. You know, I had a I had a blast diving into this team's film. And let's start this off how we always do with kind of our offseason recap additions and departures. And Greg Popovich is still here. He's still the guy. Uh, at this point, you almost wonder, all right, when the hell is this dude like going to re retire and leave, right? And you start to, to to think about, and I know this isn't necessarily an addition or a departure, but you start to think about, like, is Pop just going to be here until the Spurs are good and contending again? And, like, he, he gets another shot at a ring? And that is somewhat incredibly immature, uh, or premature, excuse me, uh, to, to say that about my 22nd-ranked Spurs team. But as we'll talk about in this episode, I don't think it's like unrealistic to say that the Spurs within the next two years can be immediately shot back up into like Western Conference powerhouse. And, you know, maybe that's the pitch to, uh, to Greg Popovich right now. Say, hey, look, Pop, can you hold on for, for two more years, buddy? We'll get you right back into contention. Um, but anyway, refocusing on the additions of departures, they don't really lose a bunch here. Like Devontae Graham is probably the most significant you know, loss for them this summer. And it's like Seti Osman, you know, they trade Doug McBuckets at the, at the deadline. He goes to, to Indiana. Um, but they gained a whole lot. Like they get Chris Paul in free agency, which at the time I was like, yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. I, I thought it was a kind of mid, you know, signing at, at the time. I, I thought it was fine. Like I thought it made sense, you know, not bad price range, you know, $10.4 million. Like, I understand it, right? And it really, like, gives this team some added depth that we're not seeing Jeremy freaking Sohan running point guard. That's kind of how bad the situation got for the Spurs at times last season. Um, and that's actually a big deal, in my opinion. Because for starters, you give Wemby, like I said, a damn point guard. And Chris Paul, as we'll talk about with his player evaluation later on, is not the same guy. He's not even the same guy that he was, like, two years ago where he was like at the back end of his run in, in Phoenix, where he actually was still a pretty good player. He's nowhere near that. Um, but this can be really, really good so that you can help mentor the younger guys kind of in this backcourt room, you know, Stefan Castle, you know, the playmaking and the self-creation stuff. And then De Devin Vassell, who specifically really, really needs the playmaking help. He can help them and mentor them and give them a kind of that, that basket of the point God wisdom that he can provide right to those young guys while also specifically Devin Vassell's case, you know, help him also be good at what he's already good at by, you know, letting Vassell cook off the ball and things like that, giving Wemby a true point guard 
that's a, a massive deal in my opinion. And then they get Harrison Barnes. They get Harrison Barnes by helping facilitate a three-team trade, which ultimately landed DeMar DeRozan in Sacramento and Chris Duarte in some seconds, if I recall correctly, to San, uh, not San Antonio, to Chicago. And this is a, like, Harrison Barnes, if I had to look up, and maybe this is mean and disrespectful, but, I mean, oh well. Uh, <laughs> if you had to look up the definition of average NBA player in the dictionary, you're probably going to see a picture of Harrison Barnes. He is perfectly fine. He's a perfectly fine player, maybe slightly overpaid. He's getting paid $18 million this season. It's the third highest cap hit on the roster this season. And I want to say the same is the case for next season as well, where he's going to be making around $19 million next season. So, and I mean, but you know, while he's maybe overpaid, that's like an okay overpay considering you are still two seasons away from being able to, you know, get to that extension for, for Victor Webb Yama at the end of that third season or so where the money kind of kicks in for that for year four. So you're still two seasons away. So that's a, that's a fine overpay. And speaking of which, like the Harrison Barnes contract. Yeah, it's, it's done. He's expired right around the time when would be extension eligible. Their books are fairly clean around then. Like it's Devin Vassell for $27 million, which we'll talk about him later. It's Keldon Johnson for 17 and a half, which, you know, I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know what they do with Keldon Johnson. Honestly, he feels like a, a trade target. But in terms of locked in money on the books, that's it. So they can offer Wemby. I mean, you have, uh, excuse me, I have Stefan Castle too on team option, but you can just offer Wemby the craziest bag and build out still a, a pretty solid team after the fact. So I don't think. I don't think I mind the getting Harrison Barnes. Fine, good enough shooter, good enough defender. I think he's really, really going to add to this step nicely. And then you get Stephon Castle. Their draft night decision making was pretty odd, um, in my opinion, at least. And it, it, it's odd from the standpoint of like if you really, really think that like the the Spurs are a playoff contender this year because if the Spurs were a team that really viewed themselves as a playoff contender this year they wouldn't have gotten that first round pick so far into the future or they would have like drafted a dawn connect or they would have like really really try to add pieces to this team they do add something in a Stefan Castle don't get me wrong but I think they would have went elsewhere with that eighth overall pick rather than trading it letting the, the Timberwolves get Rob Dillingham and uh and, and not really using that 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 spot right there but with this Stephon castle pick i think it was a fine pick ultimately you know he's a guy that you know can fit here long term i think i would have like just had my set sights set on reed shepherd if he was there at four unfortunately the rockets snag him at three um just adding on to their ridiculous you know amounts of young talent there but you know i like the pick and we'll talk more about Stephon castle here in just a sec but now let's dive into this kind of roster breakdown and why they rank here at 22nd in my power rankings. And we got to start off with kind of our tiers and things of that nature. So they rank out pretty, pretty well, actually. Greg Popovich is still in that tier two for me of, you know, pretty damn good NBA head coaches ranking from third to seventh NBA head coaches currently in, in the league. Um, Pop has been such a weird evaluation these past few years because obviously he's a legend. One of the, I mean, I really don't care how you slice it, one of the three greatest coaches of all time. Um, I would personally like lean between like him and, and Phil. I would probably say Phil. Like you have the you have the six titles in, in Chicago and then you have the five with, with Kobe and, and Shaq also a part of that duo. I would lean Phil, but then it's like Pop for me probably. Absolute legend. Right. And I think he he's had a really special connection with Wemby over the past, you know, couple uh, over the past year, I think. Um, and I I'm, I'm giving him and he's probably the only guy in the league that I could give this to. I'm giving him like actual benefit of the doubt. And this coaching grade, which does impact like some teams ratings that you do get a, some of a bump if you have a certain caliber of coach. For example, like coaches in this tier, they do give their team a, a, a bump. Um, this three to seven tier, like we mentioned. Um, I, I do think that if Pop was the head coach of like a competitive team, it could be 
it can be like a planned team. I think Pop would fairly easily elevate that team still to being a playoff team that could win a playoff series. Like put Pop on, let's just say the Cavs, right? And maybe, maybe I'm like lowballing. I think I am lowballing the Cavs. They're not like a mid team or whatever. They're like consistently a playoff team. But put Greg Popovich on the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Cavs are like an Eastern Conference Finals threat, right? Pretty consistently. And maybe that like spoils how I think about the Cavs, but you know, that that's just my, my thoughts about Pop. He's a legend. They still run crisp stuff offensively. You're never really gonna have to worry about that. And I'm curious to see like what stuff defensively can Pop cook up this season with Wemby. I, I really, really hope they like lean into Wemby at the five more. Their spacing was pretty rough at times last season. So that is one, you know, for sure gripe I had with Pop last season. Their bench is actually like really freaking solid i have the spurs bench coming in for me in this third tier of nba benches ranking in the 9th to 13th 9 to 13 range excuse me uh in the league um this is a this is a capable very very capable bench as you guys can see here they got at least three dudes i think for sure but i actually four guys that I think that can really, really play like Trey Jones, Kelda Johnson, Harrison Barnes, Zach Collins are all on a bad team starters. And you have them as your bench pieces as kind of your core bench guys that can complete a nine man rotation. And this team's healthy. And like those guys are all coming off the bench. You're looking at one of the better ones in the league. And that's a really, really strong group. But uh, and then also, you know, we got the defense. We'll talk about the defense in just a sec. They're in my tier four of NBA defenses, I think. Uh, ranking 13th to 15th for defense. Uh, B minus tier for me here. Um, this is Wemby. And I'm, I'm again, Pop also kind of contributes to this as well. Um, they have some other key guys. Like I think Stefan Castle year one is going to be a good defender. Um, there's some other stuff too we'll touch on. But let's focus on kind of the offense here to start. And let's start with. The guy that, I mean, I think people might actually be surprised at where I have him ranked at. I, I, Victor Wemiyama. I've been at an 88 overall. The arrow's definitely pointing up on Wemby. Um, and for crying out loud, what else is there to say about Victor Wemiyama that hasn't been said already? Um, rarely do you have a guy that is dubbed as a generational draft prospect truly truly live up to the hype and potentially then some in year one after the just after the rookie season after his rookie season i have Wemby ranked somewhere around like the 17th or so best player in the league and again that might be underselling Wemby, or you know that's not underselling him i think that's going to surprise some people and it makes it feel like i'm low on Wemby. that's what i really wanted to say um but it's not that's just actually that, that's flat out ridiculous and incredible for a rookie to be able to achieve that feat. He's a ridiculously good finisher around the rim with dominant and just unfair athleticism at times. He's a legitimate scoring threat. And for a guy so freakishly tall, he was a really damn good sub-creator, uh, sub-created scorer last season. Shot 38% on over 160 attempts on pull-up threes last season where for a guy his size is actually insane, and then you just talk about his ability to operate in ISO. They'll run some fun, like, inverted ball screen actions for teams. And for a big, typically your taught to just go under that and live with the three. But like I said, Wemby shot 38% on pull-up threes last season. So that shot was legitimately an efficient look for him. And teams, he he made them pay for that. Um, he has the, the bag, too, if you will, in air quotes. Like the ability to get to different moves, loves to spin when driving baseline, be able to get back to in front of the rim, which is also insane because of his wingspan. He could just like reach to the basket off that spin. Um, he's shown real flashes last season as a playmaking hub where he's shown the ability to make legitimate reads as a as a playmaking hub from the elbow out of delay action, which the Spurs will run a ton where they'll, you know, kind of go more five out, let Wemby initiate from the from the top of the key, initiating delay action, and they can go to their Zoom stuff, uh, their stagger away stuff, so they get to different actions, and they and they will play through Wemby in that regard. And then you just combine all this, this stuff with Wemby that 
you know, you could buy all that good skill related stuff, but with the fact that he is just, I think legitimately about the right stuff here in San Antonio, you know, incredibly, incredibly coachable, uh, has this insane motor and high, highly competitive spirit type of guy, which you can't necessarily grade. Like if we're playing 2k, which is kind of these ratings are treated, right? Um, if you're playing 2k, you don't have like a competitive, a, a competitiveness grade or rating, excuse me or you don't have a coachability rating, if you will. But that just increases my confidence that Wemby fairly soon is going to just just catapult himself into all-time levels of greatness because of his coachability, because of how damn competitive he is in the work ethic. I'm fully confident in that with, with, with Victor Wemby Um, And I think... There are some small, very small nitpicks, uh, but they're so small nitpicks that, like, if he's able to clean some of these things up, and I think, again, with the work ethic, the competitive spirit, I'm, like, fully confident that he's going to put the work in and try to get better at these things I identified on tape. But if he's able to clean these things up, then he has the potential to be, like, legitimately one of the five best players on the planet as early as this season like this is not a well you know maybe year three we'll figure it out no this is a we tying these things up i think he could be a top five maybe even top three player by the end of the season uh or, or at some point throughout this season number one he has to clean up the decision making and like some of the turnovers when being a like kind of that playmaking hub like we described there's times where you know he gets way way too loose with his handle or try to overcomplicate some of the reads and, you know, make passes that aren't really, really there. Um, I also think that if you're able to just body him, get a body on him and get physical, he can appear at times a little bit uncomfortable and start to force things. It will get sloppy. And I think that is just adding on like that core strength, that additional core strength and, and contact balance that, would insanely, insanely like improve his game, I think. And that ties into the turnovers because I think a lot of the turnovers you look at Wemby, yeah, it's some of them just trying to like make passes that aren't really there. But a lot of times it's him like overreacting to a bump from a defender or from a guy being physical with him. Like a Herb Jones, for example, did a great job with it. Aaron Gordon, these lower center of gravity guys compared to a Victor Wemiyama that are still like incredibly strong athletes can give him troubles at times. Um, and just, like I said, improving on that core strength and kind of the contact balance, be able to take that bump or like give the bump out to the defender. They not go anywhere and know what's next and be able to counter and get to some different things. Number two, and this is more of a weird thing and I, I'm not particularly concerned about it necessarily. I would like to see him improve as a catch and shoot three-point shooter and, and threat from that range last uh, next season. He only shot 28% on catch and shoot opportunities last season. And again, it's, it's just something that f that further enhances his game because I, I do think regardless of how good he was in, in pull-ups last season, I, I think a lot of his perimeter shots, especially from three are going to be like catch and shoot spot scenarios where a dev of a cell creates a space down the corner or whatever. And it's a catch and shoot three. A Chris Paul and Wemby go, you know, ball screen game and he picks and pops out to the to the wing and he's able to knock it down. Or maybe they go like some some five slot offense where the instead of it being like traditional five out where the big is like in the quarter corner or maybe at the top initiating delay action, he's in the slot thing like Boston this a ton with Chris stops. Um, and they'll allow him to like create their defense tries to sag off of him. He's able to catch a shoot from there. So I, I, I just think that that would make him an even further, like just a more unguardable player offensively. Think back to like Jok Jokic's, Nikola Jokic's uh, championship run. If you let that guy open, he was like unstoppable, completely unguardable in that playoff run because the jumper was there specifically on the catch for, for Jokic. And the number three, this is like the smallest of smallest nitpicks. But again, we're just talking about making Wemby the most unguardable player in basketball, potentially. And I would like to see Wemby develop a bit better touch around the rim. Again, that this is how nitpicky we are being with Wemby right now. 
I would just like to see him develop a little bit more touch around the rim. Um, it's not bad or, again, anything to be concerned with. But, again, when you do have – and there's not always going to be, you know, times where if, even if he does improve on the core strength and contact balance, like I mentioned, if he if he is able, you know, to fix that, there's still going to be occasions where the defense is just not good. Maybe he's guarded by an Anthony Davis or a Bam or whatever, right? Having the touch around the rim to where, okay, cool, good job playing defense, but it doesn't matter because my touch is ridiculous. Again, think like a Jokic or an Embiid even at times, right? That is, again, like kind of that next step where I do think he relies a lot on his athleticism and his wingspan to finish around the basket. But the touch on like some bank shots off the glass or, you know, you know jump hooks, things like that, I think – can just make him unstoppable as an offensive player. Um, and, you know, if he's able to guard, add this, this untouchable touch around the basket, he'd be like flat out unguardable within 10 feet of the rim. He's already taller than everybody, already more athletic than a lot of these guys. And now you combine that with the fact that he has good footwork. He has the touch now around the rim. I mean, how do you guard this guy around 10 feet? Do you have actual point guards here that can get in the ball on a post entry that's not just like him being taller than everybody else and just throwing him the ball? Like teams will front one B and they know that the Spurs point guard play last year and the ability to make entry passes was not good. So that, that, that that's just it, man, with Wemby. I mean, we've kind of went on about Wemby, and that's just the offense, but he already has the footwork, like I mentioned, and he has the moves in the bag, if you will. Like, he has a legit bag for a guy his size. And honestly, saying the sky's the limit for a guy like Wemby just flat out isn't doing him any justice. Like, he's an alien for a reason. And all signs and things are finally pointing up in the right direction for this franchise. And it's because they were generationally bad, got lucky in the lottery, and now they have a guy that by the end of the season, could be a top five player. I don't think that's out of, the qu- out of the question here. And then I think the second best player here, who I also, I think I underrated, and I'm actually going to give him the green arrow up as well, is Devin Vassell. Now, I don't know necessarily, like, where the, like, the growth stops. And what I mean by that is I don't know, like, what the ceiling is for a guy like Devin Vassell, truthfully. But he's a really, really fun and just dynamic score of the basketball. And like I said, to this point, I, I think I actually underrated him as an offensive talent. I knew he was good, obviously. But, man, you pop on that tape of Devin Vassell. You're like, oh, no, oh, like, shit, this guy's good. This guy's really, really good. He's a baller. And maybe, and maybe like, part of the reason why I've underrated him is because I don't think the fit between him and Wemby has always been the greatest. And that's due to, to Devin Vassell's biggest offensive concern because i think with the ball in his hands and scoring he could get to the rim he's crafty around the basket insane pull-up jump shooter but his biggest offensive concern is easily the playmaking where he's just quite frankly not good in in that in that department uh the speed of the game just weirdly hasn't slowed down for him yet when he's looking to facilitate and set up his teammates he's the definition I think right now of passing to the open guy rather than like passing players open and manipulating defenses and, and making those second level reads. Um, I think it, it, they just aren't there yet. It just consistently isn't there yet. And that again is going back to my point earlier of why I think the Chris Paul signing might actually be a good thing for the Spurs because Chris Paul, one of the greatest passing point guards of all time, definitely of like the past two decades or so. So getting this guy who is still like capable of playing, mind you onto this team, it not only allows like for the time being Devin Vassell to like hyper focus on what he's already good at, but he also gets to just learn and be, and be mentored by, like I said, one of the greatest point guards of all time in Chris Paul and, you know, pick up some of the, 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 the traits and the tendencies from, from CP and, and learn the, the art of playmaking and passing, if you will. Right. Um, and that leads me to, to talk about the positives, the overwhelming positives of Devin Vassell as a scorer, because he is truly an incredible shooting threat on or off ball. It doesn't matter with Devin Vassell. 
Shot nearly 45% on pull-up twos on, I want to say, 280 pull-up attempts last season, which is ridiculous, that amount of volume from Devin Vassell. Shot nearly 40% on catch-and-shoot threes last season on 281 attempts last season. It doesn't matter with, with this guy. Has the floater in his bag, you know, has great pace and, like, legitimate body control. When attacking downhill and getting to the pull up or just getting to the rim, he has like an underrated and like sneaky first step with the ball in his hands where he can hit you with a quick twitch move, crossover, or whatever. And now he's right by you and he's able to get to his spot in the mid range area. He's able to get downhill all the way to the basket. You know, really, really, really good feel as well. And it just IQ went away from the ball where he is an awesome relocator whether it's on, you know, slot cuts or, you know, backdoor cuts on the corner or just relocating from like the slot to the corner on a drive. And he kind of fills behind that empty space and is able to knock down a corner three. You know, he's actually, in terms of his scoring ability, a really per like, dare I say, perfect fit for what pop does. Cause I think pop can just utilize him as that on ball, go get a bucket type, but also leverage like his off screen actions and the cutting and things like that. He's not, even though he's, I think he's a bad playmaker or like definitely a subpar playmaker, he's not a ball sticker at the very least. I think he is a guy that's capable within the the, the frames of uh, of the offense and being able to just move the ball, be a ball mover, if you will. Um, he's fun. And I don't mind the contract either. It's like, uh, I want to say it's a five-year, $135 million <clears throat> contract for Devin Vassell, who is entering his age 24 season. He's going to make $29 million this year, but then he's going to make 27 next year. 27 is age 26 season, 24.6 is age 27 season. And then 27 again is age 28 season, which is only projected to be 13% of the league cap uh, of, of the team's cap, if you will, or whatever. Right. So lead league cap 27 million. Yeah. So I, I think that it's a good contract. I'm glad they're able to keep Devin Vassell around here. The, the contract kicks in sorry next season, but I don't have a problem with it. I think the arrows is actually pointing up on Devin Vassell and he's able to stay healthy and this team's able to stay healthy. He's going to be a big reason why this team is going to be in play and talks during the season. Um, and then they spend, like I said, a top five pick on a Stefan castle who I did like, you know, coming out in the draft. Um, and I think that, you know, with, with Stefan castle, first off, he is a legit NBA athlete. Um, I, I do think, though, that you are going to get, like, most of his – you're going to reap the biggest benefits of Stephon Castle, you know, with the defense, obviously. But even offensively, I think he has actual upside here. He's a really, really good athlete in space. And I think yeah, – this is one of the things that I put in my notes here – I think he really should be able to benefit from playing in NBA uh, with, with the NBA floor spacing, um, you know, has some playmaking upside. Another guy that's really going to benefit from playing next to a Chris Paul has some playmaking upside uh, that he's not, he hasn't always been able to showcase at UConn. He was a point guard before he got to UConn. Um, he does actually do a really, really good job, particularly in the half court, uh, like getting to his spots and getting to that mid range area, be able to pull up from there legitimate facilitator out of pick and roll as well playing with Donovan Klingon here like uh, in, in at UConn um I think that you know he does have some chemistry be able to find the big in that nice pocket while they're rolling to the basket I, I do think he's a high IQ type of guy um I'm a believer in the jumper it's not anywhere near consistent yet um and and not this isn't necessarily his fault this goes back to my point about the opportunity with Stephon Castle at UConn, but a large part of his of his offensive production, this is just a fact, came in transition on offensive rebounds or off ball possessions. Now, for this year, that might be fine, but when talking about Stephon Castle's ceiling as an offensive player, it does get a little weird because you didn't see him in a lead ball role, in a lead on ball role, and that's kind of that kind of goes back to my my draft take with Stephon Castle and Dobbin Klingon, where I think that UConn hurt like the perception of Stefan Castle more and it really really improved the perception of Dominic Klingon. That's not me sit like just 
crediting what Dominic Klingon did at, at UConn. But the fact that we weren't able to see Stephon Castle in a more on-ball role, it, it makes the conversation around his his ceiling as an offensive player a, a really, really, really just tough. It makes it really tough. It makes it really muddy. Um, I think despite the fact that he is a good athlete, he really does not do a good job at embracing contact at the rim. He doesn't have, you know, a m- multiple, you know, finishes they can get at, at the rim. He's going to use his athleticism. He has a couple maybe different finishes, but he's not definitely wouldn't describe him as a crafty finisher around the basket. So I, I like Stefan Castle. Um, I think the arrow is pointing up. I think he's a guy that he's actually kind of the year three guy. Where, all right, cool. Maybe by year three, we can really, really have a good idea about what he is as a player right before we have to pay him. So I do like Stefan Castle. Uh, you know, I had him as a, like a top six player on my board. It's just hard to talk about him because of the offensive question marks. Mostly dudes, like I said, just lack of opportunity at UConn. Then we have Chris Paul, who is entering i want to say it's his age yeah he's he's 39 uh he'll be 40 in may next next may obviously um and and at this point he's just a different player i think right but despite the fact that he's you know coming off his age 38 season obviously first ballot hall of famer one thing hasn't changed he is still a actually just just flat out stupid playmaker like and and i mean as a pod like, like just stupid levels of greatness that's how good he is as a playmaker per 75 possessions or you know per dunks and threes he was in the 99th percentile of assist per 75 possessions 9.4 assists per 75 possessions um and only 1.8 turnovers like he's still that good of a playmaker now the the scoring Took a dip in, in per 75 possessions is actually his worst scoring season of his career. I think that's partially due to, to opportunity in Golden State. Like they're obviously going to funnel a lot of their actions, you know, for, for Step and, and Clay last season and, you know, the other guys, Jonathan Kaminga last season, right? And that absolutely 100% like plays a part in, in that. But I do think it is actually has something to do with the age and the fact that like i said he's gonna be he's 39 currently he'll be 40 in may so i do think that that also like truly you know weighs in here um and and with chris paul now he'll still have like these random ass you know spurts of offensive brilliance um you know he had a couple of 20 point games last season i want to say his season high was 24 against dallas if i recall correctly um, but we'll see. We'll actually see like how good of an offensive player still is Chris Paul. I'm going to lean on the side of he's still in a, like a fairly elite playmaker, just lower opportunity last season, at least not the score, but again, he's still this lights out mid range jump shooter per 75 possessions, 5.5 mid range field goal attempts per 75 possessions, 87th percentile per dunks and threes and shot at a 48.1% clip. He's still ridiculous, and he is honestly one of the most special and, you know, dare I say dominant pick-and-roll operators of all time. And now you give that, who is still a good mid-range shooter, jump shooter, and a good, I mean, again, great playmaker out of ball screens. You now pair that next to Victor Webinyama, and you are cooking here in San Antonio. I Again, I still think... Despite the age, he's a more than capable playmaker. The mid-range game is fine enough, and I think they can hide him defensively too to where he's not a cone defensively. They're going to hide him. I think they're not going to give him like the lead guard matchup every night or whatever. Um, that'll be more Stephon Castle, hopefully, or more you know Jeremy Sohan if they start him. Um, but I, I like this. I like this pickup a ton, man. You give, you give Wemby a guy that can actually get him the damn basketball where at times last season, this team was like, oh, yeah, we're just not going to throw the ball to that 7-5 freakazoid down there in the paint. We're going to pretend we don't know how to make an entry pass, and we're going to you know, stru- shoot contested 23-and-a-half-foot step-back jumpers or whatever. No, you actually have somebody that can give them the ball. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. This is a kind of a smaller iteration for me of what their line could be. You know, you could go Harrison Barnes and Jeremy Sohan, but I, I don't think they're going to do that. 
Um, uh, th this is more or less like what I would do, if you will. Um, but the arrow is trending down. I think Chris Paul, this might be his last like goodish year where he like he can provide some value for an NBA team. I think this is that kind of last year. Um, it, it, it's actually embarrassing. He has a real case to be like this team's third best shooter. And normally you don't think of Chris Paul as this ridiculous shooter. No, he's probably the third best shooter here. Uh, day one, it's it's Devin Vassell, it's like probably Harrison Barnes, and then it's Chris Paul. That's ridiculous. So, again, I don't know why they didn't really consider like getting a Don, Don Connect at eight, but uh, yeah, that that that's just me. Jeremy Sohan, I mean, he's fine. Uh, I'm not a a big fan of Jeremy Sohan. They ran at the one last season. I mean, the shot. I mean, I mean, Goody, the free throws have been better. But I'm I'm just not really a Jeremy Sohan believer. He you know he he does struggle with turnovers. He's a he's a fine athlete around the rim, I suppose. But the shot is just not there. And I mean, teams will just leave him open and live with him shooting. There'll be a random game where he can like blow up and, and maybe get hot, knock down some threes. He had 31 points in a Blazers win last season, 33 in a in a Hawks loss as well back in uh, back in November. So there's moments in there still, but I'm just not like a big Jeremy Sohan guy. And then, like I said, they have good depth here. Trey Jones, Malachi Brenham, a guy that I liked in that 2022 draft class. that's still kind of figuring it out. And you're hoping that if he is going to turn into anything, you kind of see those flashes this season. Um, Blake Wesley, City Sissoko, City Sissoko, City Sissoko is the guy that I'm actually excited to watch if he gets the opportunity here. Uh, in year two for him. So that is something to, to kind of keep an eye out on. Um, Keldon Johnson, I feel like he's a trade candidate, but he's a good slasher to the rim, a capable spot-up threat, shot around 36% on spot-up threes last season. Harrison Barnes, Zach Collins, they're just, they're fine. Actually, really, really good backups, excuse me. Um, if they're starting for you, then you're probably concerned. They ran a lot of two big lineups with, with Zach Collins and Wemby. Again, to reiterate, I really, really hope they really just lean into Wemby being the five, especially like you're going to start Stefan Castle or if you're going to start Jeremy Sohan. So that your spacing isn't like amongst the five worst in the league. Like, can we at, at the very least give Wemby this? Let Wemby be the five and you just help him out defensively if he really, really needs it. But briefly touching on this defense, I mean, we, we spent hours, I mean, not literally hours, but we, we, we spent a, a good chunk of time talking about Wemby as an offensive player. But defensively, this is the first time we're bringing out this card. You guys can see the, the tiers here. He is an elite defender, not the best defensive player on the planet. I think he is probably the third best defender in the league. It's it's right up there between him and Bam, in my opinion. Um, I mean, what is there to say? Just insanely good rim protector like you you can just find the highlight tapes of Wemby just de flat out deterring guys from even daring looking at the rim and having this level of, of, of talent out there at all times being able to, to protect the rim for you is just a flat out cheat code and the league needs to do something because it's ridiculous Again, I think at times you can kind of get at him and, and throw your body around at him. And that is where I don't think quite yet he's like the best defensive player on the planet. But again, we are incredibly nitpicking. Has legit scheme versatility as well, where he is a pretty solid like lateral mover. So if you were to switch him or use him in hedging situations, that would kind of look a little funny. But if you were to do that, I think he would be able to. And again, the scheme versatility from Wemby rules here and again if he's i think first off he's probably the odds on favor to win defensive player of the year i haven't checked the odds but i i would imagine you're not necessarily winning a ton of money betting on wemby to win depoy or to win uh you know winning most approved player that also feels like a wemby lock if we're being completely honest just based on the how the you know most approved player award is kind of set up I feel like it's set up for Wemby to win, if we're being completely honest with you. Um, but he's awesome. He is awesome. Truly generational talent. And again, like I just reiterate my point from earlier, it's actually insane that 
Wemby is lived somehow lived up and potentially then some to the sky high expectations that were set on him heading into year one. But that's not all. They have a legitimately, like, I think solid defense to where, like I said at the top, if everybody's healthy, they should be a middle of the pack to like above average NBA defense coming in here. Like I said, tier four, 13th to 15th defense in the league, in my opinion. Um, a lot of that's Wemby, a lot of that's pop, but they do have some other guys. Stephon Castle, like I said, year one is going to be a really, really good NBA defender. And I am honestly like trying not to overrate him here. So that's why I kind of stuck him at this green tier where he is a good starting caliber defender. I think he'll take on a lot of the assignments on uh, from like the opposing backcourts and, you know, some of the best guards, if you will. Right. But his technique when guarding ball screen, it just flat out the, like, the effort and the recovery speed when like, okay, if you do set a really, really good screen on him, his ability to recover and still contest from behind is flat out ridiculous. He has great contact strength where you can, you can kind of bump him and hit him or whatever. <clears throat> and it really, really doesn't matter, right? Moves his feet incredibly, incredibly well to guard in space at, at a freaking high level. Um, I don't know what else to say about Stefan Castle. He has a case. I mean, not a case. I think he is the best true on ball point of attack defender in this draft class. And I mean, this is sky high praise of, of you know, Stefan Castle as the defender. But if Stefan Castle in like three years, give him three years, is, you know, somewhere around Alex Caruso levels of on ball POA defense, or maybe Jalen Suggs. See, I think, I think Suggs and Castle are both more like disruptors defensively with their POA defense. If he's like at that level in a, in a few years, by like year three, it would have surprised me one bit. Um, and then you have like Chris Paul is a solid, you know, defensive playmaker where I think his hands and his timing is still at this age pretty solid. You don't want him guarding his base for too long because I think like you can attack CP in space. But, you know, I, I think it is what it is with CP. I think they'll have guys like Wemby and other guys behind him that can protect them and. I think he'll be he'll be more than fine. Uh, Jeremy Sohan, Jeremy Sohan. I mean, this is the side of the ball where he does contribute the most. He's a fine defensive playmaker. You know, one point three steal percentage, one point five block percentage. Again, I, I think I think he's a touch overrated. I never really liked that pick. They draft him in the top ten back in the twenty twenty two draft class. Um, never really really been a fan of that that selection, and you know, draft take right by me i suppose um but he is a good defender i think him next him and castle with wemby in this in this starting five can can do some really really fun stuff together um they have some other guys here too defensively like trey jones fine Kelvin johnson is you know a helper you would like to see like more defensive activity and involvement from Kelvin johnson defensively but in his role i suppose he he's, he's a fine defender you could get worse for sure Harrison Barnes, I think, is also a pretty solid defender. I think he can guard opposing wings and draw that assignment. If, like Jeremy saw us to miss a game or they were to start Harrison Barnes, um, he could get that assignment. I think he'll do fairly all right. Has good technique, good lateral quickness, you know, pretty athletic player, even still at, at his age. Um, so this is the, the, the Spurs team. This is the Spurs team. Let's kind of wrap up here with their, you know, their, their strengths and weaknesses. Strength number one, it's it's Wemby, flat out. Like like I said at the top, I, I don't know how much more praise I can give him, other than saying that I think legitimately he can be one of the three to five best players by as early as this season. Um, he he's a incredibly incredibly special talent, and the the again the sky saying the sky's the limit for a guy like Wemby is not doing him justice. That's how freaking special he is, man. Um, I love their depth here, actually. We didn't talk about them as much as I probably should have, but Trey Jones as now your backup point guard here, coming off of one of his best seasons, if not his best season of his career, where the playmaking, he's always been a good playmaker. You would like to see the turnover percentage drop a little bit, but a guy that can, you know, get to the rim, has a nice 
has a solid enough, you know, mid range game. We'd like to see him get a higher usage of that. Didn't really shoot the mid range at all last season. As a matter of fact, last season, in terms of uh, mid range field goal attempts per 75 possessions, that was a career low for Trey Jones. But now that's your backup point guard, Harrison Barnes. I project to be their backup three slash four. Same with Keldon Johnson. Zach Collins, for what he is, is perfectly fine. You'd like to see him get back to like 22, 23 version of Zach Collins though with the shooting where, you know, last season he shot 32% from three, where the previous season he shot 37% and the year before that 34%. So you're hoping they can get back to that. But again, solid depth. You have Malachi Brenham in like CD Sissoko, for example, guys that are young and very raw and, and still in their development process, but could take another step and, it really adds to this depth that I already rank fairly highly here. Um, again, coming in, you know, above, you know, above the pack, actually, like I said, uh, towards the top in this tier of the like nine to 13 range, nine to 14 range uh, of, of benches around the league. So their, their depth is awesome here. Pop is a legend. So the coaching here is the legitimate strength. And I think with a competitive team now, like pop, we're gonna see pop kind of remind people that he is still a top seven or so coach in the NBA. The shooting is a concern for me, though. Um, like I said, Chris Paul is probably the their third best shooter, like off rip. It's Devin Vassell, uh, it's like Harrison Barnes, probably, and then it's like Chris Paul. So the shooting here does actually concern me. And then, like, God forbid Devin Vassell gets hurt, and then you are really, really in trouble. The self-creation scoring. Now, granted. I, I think they the Spurs can still run a lot of their, their their stuff like from their offense and things like that, but I do think that's something that concerns me. And then the Western Conference, the Western Conference is a legitimate weakness for this team because I I truly feel that put this Spurs team in the East. It's a reason why we've like straight up talked about all Eastern Conference teams for a while. If the Spurs were in the East. I would like hands down have them as 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 at the bare minimum a playing team in the contention for like maybe even getting a six seed, if you will, right? I think their mindset as an organization would be a little bit different too. I think they would have really went for it if they were in the East and tried to get to like that six seed range. Whereas in the West, they are what the thirteenth team in the West for me currently, like still technically. I've only talked about two teams in the West so far. I've talked about the Jazz. I've talked about the, the uh, not the Rockets, the Blazers. Those are the two Western Conference teams I've discussed at this point. So that means that, what, 12 of the top 21 teams in the league, in my opinion, are all from the West? That's absurd, right? And in, in any other year, the Spurs are, like, in a dogfight for that playing spot. And... I think this is another year in the rebuild. I think they'll be way more competitive. They're over under set at 36 and a half. I would either bet the under or just not bet that at all. Cause again, I think the West is just such a, just so brutal for everybody that I'm not betting on a lot of these over unders to be quite frank with you for these Western conference teams. And this team is legitimately solid. Wemby turns into a top five player. They still might miss the playoffs because of how loaded the Western Conference is, which is insane to me. So that's a legitimate weakness. Take a look at these Vegas odds via FanDuel. NBA Finals, plus 15,000 odds to win a championship. Not betting that you know, you're know you wasting money at that point. This team is still a ways away from being an NBA you know, championship contender. To make it out of the West, plus 8,000. Again, ways away, not touching that. If I were to touch anything... Out of this, I don't love that over under projection because that's like that's dangerous. I think I would have put them around 33 and a half, maybe. But if you're betting the over on their over under odds for, for win total projections, I mean, you might as well say, Hey, look, maybe this team can sneak into the play in, maybe this team can win one or two games and making a playoffs at plus 420 odds aren't the worst thing, you know, is it the worst bet in the world? especially if you're as high on Wemby as I am that thinks that Wemby can be, like I said, a top three player by the end of the season. So that is all for today, guys. Thank you for tuning into my in-depth analysis of the San Antonio Spurs team.
Coming here, ranking 22nd, my power ranking series. We have another episode for you guys dropping this week. Maybe two more. We'll see how, how fast I can push these out. But thank you all so, so much for watching. Make sure you guys hit the like button and subscribe here to the channel for more great content. Till next time, see ya and peace out.